Hey everyone, this article is about Brazil, junk food, and obesity. This is from the New York Times. Um, don't have the date, don't have the author, but it came up in my feed, excuse me. Um, and I thought it was kind of interesting because it says a lot about obesity and it says a lot about how it develops. So this is a good case study. It follows a woman, I forget her name, I guess if we go down here, um, there we go, Miss De Silva. She's a door-to-door -door vendor, uh, sorry Logitech, she's a door-to-door -door vendor for Nestle. Nestle is the big uh, food conglomerate, the big Swiss giant. I think they did $100 billion in revenue last year, so this is a massive company. Um, I'll double check that, uh, don't quote me, but it, it's the l largest food company in the world. You probably have something in your pantry that was made by Nestle, because not everything says Nestle chocolate on it. Um, they make a lot of stuff, like infant formula. And this is what this, this story is about. So she goes door to door selling um, pudding, cookies, and other packaged food foods, as the article discusses, Kit Kat bars, uh, infant cereal, and it takes place in Fortaleza, Brazil. According to this article, 20% of Brazilians are now obese, which is incredible. That's double what it was just 10 years ago. And every year, 300,000 people are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, which is called, or adult onset or non-insulin dependent, however you want to call it. And a lot of that is because I think uh, countries like Brazil are developing. And what happens when countries get, when they develop, is they become lazier. I hate to say it, but they go from the fields and they move into cities and they do less demanding work. When they do that, they also make more money and they have access to restaurants and processed foods. They have less time, so they don't want to cook in the home anymore. It's exactly what happened in the United States in the 1940s and 50s, right after the war. A lot of women went into the workforce and life sped up. Things got faster. We had cars, we had machines. And the paradox of that is the more machines we invented, the more, um, the busier we got. But we also developed a lot of leisure time, too. It's not like we were working 80 hours a week, which is what we were working um, in the early 1900s. My point is people were working, doing less physically demanding work, but they also didn't want to spend all of their time cooking. Think about what a woman's life was 150 years ago. She was cooking nonstop or she was, um, you know, sewing or ironing clothes it was just a non-stop non-stop maintenance that's all her life was and a lot of women demanded cheaper more convenient foods and companies like nestle kellogg's um, pepsi they kind of filled the gap so let's go into this article Ms. De Silva weighs more than 200 pounds, and she she was she discovered that she had high blood pressure, a condition she acknowledges is probably tied to her weakness for fried chicken, thanks KFC, and the Coca-Cola she drinks with every meal, breakfast included. So this these are relatively new foods to people, and here they are here. I guess that's her right in the middle. Um, yeah, Ms. De Silva, uh, de de delivering the foods that are actually making her fat. So what's happening in Brazil is they're moving from a traditional diet that was that had starches, um, meat, and fruits, which is a very nice diet. It's also not very convenient, and it's also not nearly as rewarding as the foods that are being sold on the market. That's another problem with processed food. You take a bunch of sugar, you combine it with a bunch of oil and a bunch of other chemicals, and you can make something that is way more enticing than what you would find in nature the food that you find in nature that's unprocessed actually isn't that great um have you ever had a raw sweet potato have you ever had a, a piece of fruit picked from the tree have you ever had raw meat it doesn't taste that great we humans have this ability to take raw ingredients and turn it into something that's really really rewarding and i think that's what you're seeing here and then they talk about um, the transformation of the food system. As growth slows in the wealthiest countries, multinational food companies like Nestle, Pepsi, and General Mills have been aggressively expanding their presence in developing nations. So if you look at countries like the U.S., Canada, Britain, you actually, you're seeing a different trend. We celebrated a better life through chemistry in the 1950s and 60s. We glorified processed food. We thought processed foods were this advancement. Now we know a little better. Now we're actually going the opposite direction. 
right? We're, we're thinking we need more unprocessed food. We need more natural foods. We need more organic foods. You're seeing demand for a different type of product. I'm not saying that, you know, Apple Jacks and uh, Pepsi aren't selling very well. They're still selling well. But as societies get wealthier, they tend to gain weight at first. So you look at India, Indonesia, Brazil, because people aren't working as much, physically at least. They have access to more goods. They have access to more services. Um, the cost of food goes down. They spend a less proportion... They spend a smaller proportion of their budget on food, which is good and bad. They demand more convenience. They can eat out more. That all comes with a cost, right? I think this is just a natural cost of developing. It's like burning a, a ton of fossil fuels. Well, that's great because we can we have more transportation, um, more plastic, uh, life expectancy goes up, but we also warm up the planet too. So it's like you take the good with the bad. And I think this is what happens as countries initially develop. Then after a certain point, um, once people have a certain level of leisure time and they have access to information and they have more wealth to spend on their health, uh, they start demanding higher quality foods. That's why you're seeing so much stuff like um, HelloFresh and Blue Chef and Trifecta and all of these other home delivery services that can bring us healthy food. Uh, that's why you're seeing a huge growth in places like Whole Foods. That's why you see so many new products on the market that promise to improve our health. We don't just want processed foods. We want processed foods that actually make us healthier. But it takes a certain level of wealth to reach that point. And I'm arguing that countries like Brazil just haven't reached that point in the economic development. They they don't have enough wealth to afford the personal trainers, to afford the 24-7 uh, gym. They don't have the money to go to Whole Foods. They don't have the money um, or the time to buy exercise equipment. We take that for granted. If you're watching this, you probably take that for granted. You probably have access to those services. You're probably not watching this from Brazil. If you are, hello, thank you for watching. But we need to respect that certain countries are at different points in their development. So I don't think we can completely blame this on the multinational food companies. It's easy to demonize them and say, oh, they're making the world fat. They're really just delivering what people want. And at this point, people in Brazil don't want to spend all their time cooking freshly prepared meals. As great as that is, life is changing in Brazil. And now they want more convenient stuff. They want stuff that you can eat by opening a wrapper. And we need to respect that. It talks, it talks about the um, kind of the paradox of, of our modern day. We have more obese people than underweight people for the first time in history, but we also have a lot of malnourished people. Just because you're obese doesn't mean you're properly nourished. You have enough calories, more than enough, but you might not have all of the micronutrients that you need. You might not be eating the healthiest diet. In fact, you're, you're definitely not eating the healthiest diet. It's almost like you have two crises at the same time. You have obesity and then you have malnourishment. So what are we going to do about that? I argue that the best way to do that is to speed up development. The, Brazil's going through some growing pains right now. They have rising levels of obesity. They've got the fires. Um, they've got environmental destruction. They've got crime. Brazil will grow out of it eventually. Brazil will reach that cer certain level of wealth where people can afford services that we take for granted, but they're not there yet. There are multiple factors in the rise of obesity, including genetics, urbanization, growing incomes, and a more sedentary lifestyle. Yeah, the sedentary lifestyle, I would say growing incomes is probably the biggest reason why when people leave the fields, um, you know, they just, they don't want to cook meals all the time and they have access to more food. So they start valuing convenience. And that goes hand in hand with urbanization. As people, as countries urbanize, they tend to get wealthier because that's where the majority of the wealth in a country is produced. Fortaleza, Florinopolis, um, uh, Sao Paulo, Minas Gerais, uh, Salvador de la Bahia, you know, all those, those big urban centers in, in Brazil. It's not in, you know, the interior of the Amazon, but that's true in every country. Sean Westcott, head of food research at Nestle, conceded obesity has been an unexpected side effect of making inexpensive processed food more widely available. Notice the language there, unexpected side effect. I would say it's a very expected side effect. Now, I don't think, I don't think we can blame Nestle. I wouldn't want to be a Nestle salesman myself, but 
what is Netflix supposed to do? Just not sell anything? I mean, if you have people clamoring for convenience and different types of foods and processed foods, why would you not sell it to them? You know that, yes, some of them, a lot of them are going to overeat it, but what are you supposed to do? Just deny it to them and say, no, you have to cook three fresh meals a day. I, I, I don't know what the alternative would be. Here are some statistics for you. 700 million obese people worldwide, and one-seventh of them are children. And here is the, the graph. 1980, here are obesity rates 10% in the U.S. Now it's 27% as of 2015. Although I've seen research that says that it kind of peaked around that time too. Um, Mali, of all places, 0.7 to 11. Brazil is almost tripled. Um, China, 0.7 to 5. I heard Chinese people are getting really fat these days. I have a pen pal over there. She says uh, people are getting big over here. The story is, is as much about economics as it is nutrition. I would say so. Um, they are transforming local agriculture, spurring farmers to abandon subsistence crops. Yes. Um, it is the economic system that pulls in mom and pop stores, big box retailers, blah, blah, blah. The obesity epidemic is inextricab inextricably linked to the sale of packaged foods, which grew 25% worldwide uh, from 2011 to 2016, compared to 10% in the United States. Um, and I would, argue, I would argue that soft drinks contribute a lot of that. When I was in Mexico in 08, 09, they were selling soda everywhere. It was crazy how much soda they drink. I think they drink, I think Mexicans drink more soda per capita than Americans. Um, so we're not number one in that, in that regard. Industry defenders say that processed foods are essential to feed a growing urbanizing world of people, many of them with rising incomes, demand and convenience. And this is my point. Um, if you're in business, um, one thing you need to understand is that you can't manufacture desire. You can only deliver that desire. You can only deliver solutions to that desire. The desire is there and you have to deliver a solution that's there and you have to market to connect that solution to the desire. Okay. I don't want to turn this into a business, um, video, but that's just, that's a point that I want to make because I hear people like, Robert Lustig say, oh, they're just, they're, we're getting fat because of all this marketing. Well, the thing is marketing only works when you share a message with people who have the desire. You can't create the desire, but I don't expect people like Dr. Lustig to understand that. Is this necessary to feed a growing urbanizing world? I don't see any other way. Um, as they start urbanizing and they, and their level, their income levels start to start to rise, you're just going to see a rise in obesity. It's like, it's like saying you can grow up without any pain. You know, you can't grow up without muscle spasms. You can't grow up without all of the, uh, you know, the zits and the pimples and all of the, you know, sexual development that occurs in puberty. That's what Brazil is in right now. It's in a puberty. A professor at University College Dublin says, if I asked 100 Brazilian families to stop eating processed food, I have to ask myself, what will they eat? Who will feed them? How much will it cost? Exactly. Um, it's just a growing pain. I think the big problem here is our brains. Our brains are just naturally hardwired for cheap, tasty food. We don't like to expend a lot of energy to obtain food. Packaged foods deliver that. We like food that tastes good. Packaged foods have that. Um... Yeah, so when you combine taste and convenience and price, okay, a lot of this stuff is cheap. It's just the perfect storm. That's why processed food is is so popular and that's why it's so addicting sometimes because as much as I like a homemade meal, it's just not always possible to do that. I'm on the go, I'm in different places, I can't I don't have a portable refrigerator and a portable microwave and a portable stove. That would be wonderful. Welcome to the real world. What we have here is a war between two food systems, a traditional diet of real food once produced by the farmers and the producers of ultra processed food designed to be over consumed and which in some cases are addictive. Yeah. And it's a war, but one food si one system has disproportionately more power than the other. And again, I would argue it's just a part of economic development. You know, that's what, that's what happens when, when countries developed. Um, eventually, Brazil will reach a point where people start demanding healthier food and more people have enough leisure time to work out. Um, they're just not at that point yet. 
And then here's a picture of that Brazilian family. This looks a lot, a lot, a lot like the patients I serve, unfortunately. Um, she's sitting, she's overweight, she's on a phone, she's distracted, got the TV in the background. I mean, the whole this whole picture, this is a great photo, by the way. Um, it's just, it encapsulates so much of what I'm talking about. You've got an overstimulated girl over here. You've got overstimulated kids, and you know, she looks pretty young. You've got a lot of leisure time, right? And you've got uh, malnutrition all in one. It's just an overall unhealthy lifestyle. Um, there's really no easy solution to this. Now, they can eat more fruits and vegetables, okay? When I was in Mexico, fruits and vegetables were super cheap. I could, you know, find some spare change under my sofa <laughs> and go buy oranges and jicama and guavas. In fact, I just got a couple guavas today. I love, I love those things. Um, it, whatever I wanted. Now, of course, you can't sustain yourself just on that. But if you want healthy options, they're always available. And I've made a video before about how to eat right in the food desert, how to eat right, how to eat right at work. Wherever you are, you can always make better decisions. Maybe not the ideal decision, but better decisions. Now they talk about this other woman, Joanna Vasconcelos. I hope I'm saying that right. I don't speak Brazilian Portuguese very well. Um, none at all, actually. Uh, let's see, Miss de Vasconcelos has diabetes and high blood pressure, which usually go hand in hand. Her 17-year-old daughter weighs more than 250 pounds, has hypertension and polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is usually, um, usually associated with obesity, although not always. Her father died three years ago after losing this feet to gangrene. Jeez, a complication of diabetes. She says one thing here that I want to point out. People have to eat. Exactly. So why I'm, I'm not a big fan of food policing. I'm not a big fan of people who are trying to tax stuff and trying to restrict things and trying to tell us what to eat and trying to restrict advertising. Listen, just let people eat and let them learn. Uh, eventually, they will learn. Eventually, they will adopt healthier habits. Keep in mind, the people in these in this article, they have a fraction of the income that we have. We just assume, oh, you can go to the gym and um, you can buy fresh produce and you can, um, you know, do this and do that and you can be really healthy. We just assume we have access to that. These people in Fort Alaysa, they don't have access to that. They're making three, four, five thousand dollars a year. It's just, it's not going to happen. But like I said, wherever you are, wherever you are, you can make better decisions. Um, when I lived in Mexico, this is a small town, like 90,000 people. They had a gym there. Was it a great gym? No, wasn't, but I still found a way. I ran outside. I would go out into the country and run up and down this country road. It wasn't the best place to run, but I wanted it so bad and it was so important to me. I just did it. You know, I just, you know, made it work, but I'm not, I'm not saying these people are lazy or anything, but um, eventually they will obtain a certain level of wealth and awareness to start making those decisions. And here's a picture of a McDonald's in, um, I don't know where this is. Let's see, Sao Paulo. So they've got the VR here and they've got a Big Mac and I think she's wearing some, I don't know, looks like she's a superhero sometime. Maybe they're promoting some movie. I, I'm not even sure. I just think it's kind of funny. Um, I'd like to go to a, uh, McDonald's in Brazil now. So you got McDonald's and now you've got the flag, uh, Brazilian flag. I wonder which one is more powerful. This this um, article goes into the politics of the food industry and how the food industry is trying to influence the regulations. Really, I think the best regulation is no regulation. Sometimes we just have to muddle through. That's the best option. And I think that's Brazil's best option. All of these um, policies that they're... Um, trying to pass, you know, like restricting advertising, restricting and saturated fat. I just, I don't think it's going to make a dent in the problem. Here's some more statistics on Brazilian children. 9% were obese in 2015, a 270% increase since 1980. Uh, United States, 12.7% of children are obese. That's just incredible. Like one in eight. In some neighborhoods, 30% of children are obese, usually the poor ones, and another 30% are malnourished. Um, so again, you have this twin, you have this twin crisis, you know, malnourishment plus obesity, all in one environment. Um, it's it's kind of a kind of a paradox if you think about it. 
And rising obesity rates are largely associated with improved economics. Exactly. And families with increasing incomes embrace the convenience, status, and flavors of packaged foods. I think it's interesting they mentioned status. Uh, I know we like, we like to talk about fast food with derision. Uh, you know, it's cheap, junky food. Who would eat that? Keep in mind that McDonald's brought the dining experience to millions of people. That's why it was so popular. Wow, we can eat out and it's only going to cost us a few dollars. Before McDonald's and fast food, eating out was a luxury that a lot of people didn't have. And so in some places, eating at a fast food restaurant is seen as a certain uh, status symbol. Like, wow, we've made it. We can go out for KFC, you know. Rice, beans, salad, and grilled meats. Building blocks of the traditional Brazilian diet are falling by the wayside, studies have found. It's because it's not convenient. That's pretty much what it is. Notice how, too, rice, beans, and grilled meats. Building blocks of the tr traditional Brazilian diet. What have I said all along? People gravitate towards a diet that is that has a lot of carbs, rice and beans, some vegetables, salad, and some animal protein, grilled meats. Okay, I'm vindicated again. Just thought I would say that. All right, let's keep going. Rampant street violence keeps young people cooped up indoors. It's too dangerous to let my kids play outside, so they spend all their t free time sitting on the couch playing video games and watching TV. Something tells me they would do that anyway, but um, it goes to show you that there's something. There's uh, there are other factors. So we take safe streets for granted here. Not everybody can. And Brazil is, uh, as I understand, is a really dangerous country. Like many Brazilian mothers, she was pleased when Isaac began to gain weight. I always thought fatter is better when it comes to babies. She indulged his eating habits, which included frequent trips to fast food outlets and no fruits and vegetables. So this is, when you look at obese people, keep in mind, they probably grew up in an environment where obesity was kind of encouraged, um, where people ate a lot, where every, every, every day there was a reason to eat, or their parents fed them really bad, or they fed them comfort food. So if you grow up in that kind of environment, um, you know, the deck is stacked against you. Doesn't mean you don't have a chance, but um, kids who are obese tend to be obese as, adult, as adults. And it's even harder to lose the weight when you're an adult. That's what we know. Many children will nonetheless face a lifelong battle with obesity. That's unfortunately true. If you start obese, you're probably going to end it obese. Um, doesn't mean, doesn't mean um, you can't do anything about it. Doesn't mean you don't have hope, but it's just going to be that much harder. Childhood malnutrition can lead to permanent metabolic changes, reprogramming the body so it more readily turns excess calories into body fat. Yeah, it's just kind of a kind of a tragedy because when you're a kid, you just eat, right? Um, you don't really think about it. You don't know about macros. You don't know about portion control. You don't know about you don't know anything basically when you're a kid. I remember when I was a kid, I used to eat a lot of crap. Okay, and I'm fortunate that when I was 19 or 20, I started to uh, understand this stuff and I started to explore it. I have too much information at this point. Um, you know, like, too much information is a bad thing after, after a point, but I'm glad I know this stuff and I just take this knowledge for granted. When we look at people like this here, they don't know anything about nutrition. Uh, I mean, maybe they are, he's eating a salad now, but, um, it, it, it's easy to, I look at some people who are eating just crap and I think, how can you do that? Well, the reason why is because they're at a different level of awareness. When I was 18, I didn't even know that the three main carb uh, the three main macronutrients were carbs, protein, and fat. I didn't even know that. I didn't know that until I was 19 years old. So give people time is what I'm saying. The industry's expansion provides economic benefits to people up and down the ladder, which is going to make it even harder to beat this because now people depend on these food companies for employment. I mean, what are, you, what are you going to do? Deny people employment? So it makes it makes it even that much harder. Um, it I don't know if it's a public health crisis, but it's going to be that much harder for policymakers and lawmakers to do anything about it. I don't really, I don't think they should be doing anything about it. Um, you just have to let Brazil develop. That's really the only option. Last point here, they go back to Ms. Da Silva. She is aware of the connection. I like that word, aware between her diet and her persistent health problems, but insists that her children are well-nourished, gesturing to the Nestle products in her living room. I've made this point before. We always make a trade-off between convenience, price, and nutrition, and that's what she's doing. Yes, she's aware that her diet is, you know, uh, killing her <laughs> slowly, 
but she's willing to make that trade off. You know, she, she's got all these products in her house. Her kids are well fed. They like the products. She's employed. Maybe that's a risk that she's willing to take. And we have to respect that. Okay, guys, I hope you found this video educational and entertaining. Don't forget to check out some of my other videos. I will make more video. I will make more videos about these kind of articles in the future. If there's something that you want me to talk about, let me know in the comments below. I already have a bunch of articles in the queue, so you will see more of these in the future. I also made a video about obesity in Mexico. You can find that link in the description box below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.